Hi SALT users, this is Joyelle from SALT Software and in this lecture we're going to be going over language sample analysis using SALT Software. So our learning targets today are how language sample analysis fits within your comprehensive evaluation. We're going to go through the elicitation protocols that are available if you want to do a database comparison. We're going to go through the steps of the whole language sample analysis process and then we'll have a demonstration on how to interpret a standard measures report and learn how to pull other reports um, from the software related to your case study. So let's start off with why would you use language sample analysis as part of your evaluation. Um, a lot of school districts require standardized testing um, and some other informal measure or not just standardized testing data but lots of different um, data points. So really using language sample analysis is an authentic measure of the speaker's oral language. So the person has to use their whole language system at the same time. It's not segmenting any one part of our language system. It's also in a naturalistic context. So it's a conversation or we're talking about books. So it's um, more naturalistic than perhaps a standardized test. A lot of times we get feedback saying, oh yeah, this is, you know, it substantiates the referral, what parents or teachers were concerned about. So I think that's one of the strongest um, supports of why to include language sampling in your evaluation. Um, it can assist in diagnosing or qualifying students. Um, it augments standardized testing. Certainly we wouldn't want to only do language sample analysis, but it can really um, complement your standardized testing. And also, you can think about this with older children, maybe middle school, even high school. It can help with dismissal from services as well. And it's also more culturally responsive. So you're just sitting down and having a conversation. You can talk about whatever topics you'd like. Um, or it's literacy-based. It can also be more descriptive of language performance and you'll find the speaker's strengths and weaknesses with language sample analysis. So a lot of times it's good to see what the strengths are and play those up and maybe work on the um, weaknesses as well in therapy. It can help you with developing an intervention plan and you can monitor intervention in progress um, and update your IEP goals. So really what you can do if you're doing a language sample is you can just get a lot of data out of one measure, one language sample. So for example, um, I personally really like to do the narrative story retells. So I get all of my language measures and then I do the narrative scoring scheme that tells me about structure and content. I can do the subordination index that tells me about syntax measures. And then specifically for the retails, we also have comprehension questions. So really you just get tons of data just from taking one language sample. So it's certainly worth your time um, to collect the sample and transcribe it. Um, the databases that we have are of typically developing children and we'll go over those in detail later on, but you do have normative data to compare your sample to. Consistent transcription format for all your language samples. So again, you're consistently collecting um, the same way and you're transcribing the same way every time as opposed to hand transcribing. You'll learn the um, conventions for transcription. So every sample is very comparable to one another. The results are fast in the software. Um, it's easy to analyze and interpret. And we also have some um, features in the software that really help speed up your speed up your diagnostic reports. So it's well worth your time. So step one in the process is to record a representative sample. So this can be um, generally you kind of know what questions you want to have answered by taking a language sample. So you can think about it as optimizing developmental progress. It's reflecting your speaker's typical language. And also some of the protocols are more challenging. So you'll get different results based on if you take a conversation or something that's more um, demanding, such as a persuasive or even a story retell. Also, you wanna make sure that you are recording your samples. Um, I use just my recording to, um, 
device on my iPad or tablet, sometimes just on my phone, and then I can download it and transcribe it pretty easily. So the types of language sample that are available um, are conversation, and those are divided into play and then play-based conversations for younger children, and then conversation. We have narrative student selects the story, narrative story retell, exposition, and persuasion. And we'll go through um, here is the age range and the grade for the SALT reference databases that you can see. So the play base starts at two years, eight months, and goes to five, and then conversation um, all mixed together goes up into 13 years. The narrative student selects a story, so that's where they choose to tell you all about a book or a TV show that they have watched. Sometimes that can be motivating because the topic might be really interesting to the student. That goes from five until 13. Narrative story retell, um, these are the book-based elicitations, and we'll go on to the next slide. So we have Frog, Where Are You for um, four to seven-year-olds. Pookins Gets Her Way for second graders. Third graders typically do a porcupine named Fluffy. Fourth, fifth, and sixth do Dr. DeSoto. Um, so again, I usually... When I do these, I go by grade level. If the book is too complicated, you maybe can drop down um, to the next lower leveled book for the story retell. Um, we also have the expository protocol, and that is where they are given a planning sheet and they are asked to explain a favorite game or sport. That's for older children ages 10 to 18. And then the persuasion, um, is for high schoolers and again think about these as far as um, not only qualifying you might not be qualifying children necessarily at this age but for dismissal and um, progress monitoring um, so persuasion is where the student is given a topic that they want to persuade kind of an authority figure um, to get their way about something so it could be um, later start time on school or um, dress code at school, things like that, that are kind of high interest to um, high school students. And then we do have the test of narrative language and the test of narrative language second edition. So if you are doing that standardized test, we have all of those language samples and you can look at either each individual um, story, you know, there's three of the stories, um, or you can look at all three of them combined. If you are doing bilingual assessment for Spanish and English, there are a ton of options in SALT software, and this I really think is um, just such a strength of the software because you have an authentic measure for bilingual um, speaker. And what I really like is that you're comparing bilingual samples, um, comparing two bilingual samples. So it's not just monolingual Spanish speaking or monolingual English, but it's children who are bilingual and are acquiring English. So that I think for my bilingual caseload just makes me feel a lot more confident as far as um, a representative normative database to compare these students to. So for um, the retells, Spanish ingual, English bilingual, um, there's frog, where are you? Frog goes to dinner, frog on his own, and you can see the age range um, and grade in school. And then we also have um, bilingual Spanish-English unique story, so that's where they're generating their own story without that model first. So that can be a good option to, um, if you're interested in that. I do want to point out that there are a lot of training materials available on our SALT website. They're all free of charge. Um, so you can go to saltsoftware.com and then click on the training. and courses 1201 and 1202 all deal with elicitation if you're interested. Um, so again the SALT resources they're available on the website. Um, SALT 20 has a lot of help menus um, built in to the software and then we also have a textbook that's pretty much everything you need to know about language sample analysis and SALT software that's available. So what I'm going to do now is show you a short clip of 
um, a collection of Frog Where Are You just to look at kind of the elicitation techniques. I'm here with Carly and Carly is how old? Five. Five years old. Okay. And Carly... Five and a half. Five and a half. Oh, okay. All right, so what I want to do is find out how you tell stories. So I do, yep, I've got my, um, this is our microphone, and that'll pick up our voices. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you this story, and then when I'm done, you get to tell it back to me using your own words. Okay. It's called Frog, Where Are You? By Mercer Mayer. Okay. I make phony noise. I heard that. That's kind of funny. <laughs> okay, are you ready to listen? Yes. Yes, okay. All right, here we go. So, once there was a boy who had a dog and a pet frog. Frog with him. They had some baby frogs, and one of them jumped towards the boy. Aw, baby frog. cute. The baby frog liked the boy and wanted to be his new pet. The boy and the dog were happy to have a new pet frog to take home. As they walked away, the boy and the frog said goodbye to his old frog and his family. The end. Okay, now, Miss Carly, it's time for you to tell the story. I can't wait to hear your story. So just do the best you can and use your own words. Go ahead. Yeah. Doggy looked into the bucket, and there was a frog. The froggy jumped down, and the and the when the boy wake up, woke up, there was no more frogs in the jar. So he got he looked in his shoe, he, and the dog looked in the bucket, and he got his head stuck. So the boy looked out the empty window, and then the jaw was heavy, and the dog fell out of the window. The boy came out, and it was mad. <laughs> nice. Doing great. Then the bees have dropped, and a frog had a mama, and baby. One of them jumped to the boy, and it was his dad. And he has a new pet frog. All done. All done. Wow, that was so good. Thank you. I loved hearing your story. Nice work. Okay, so hopefully after watching that video, you kind of get a sense of how it looks to collect a language sample. Um, really, this is one of my favorite parts of the process because kids always keep you on your toes um, with all the fun things that they do. So um, that little student was really fun to work with. Um, so a couple of things to note about the clinician in that video is you'll notice um, when the student is giving their narrative retell, you want to just kind of really be an active listener just with affirmations like mm -hmm, good job oh just you know showing that you're really excited to listen to their story but then not inserting yourself with questions or lots of verbal prompts um, so your narrative doesn't sh you know, kind of morph into a conversation so um, we'll keep going here step two that we'll talk about um, in the language sample analysis process is transcription. So transcription is probably everyone's least favorite part of language sample analysis. Um, but what we want to do is transcribe your sample and the analysis of your language sample is dependent on the integrity of your transcripts. So basically you have to, you know, put some effort in and have a quality um, transcript and the more you put in, the more you get out, um, which kind of makes sense. SALT does try to limit the number of transcription conventions, so transcribing is easy and fast once you learn the conventions. And another benefit of that is that the SALT transcripts can be read by someone who's not a speech-language pathologist. So parents and teachers, team members, they're, you know, you can read them um, fairly clearly. So it's kind of that balance of putting in enough, marking enough morphemes and things like that, but making it um, doable and 
so that they're readable. Um, again, there's tons of online training if you're interested in learning how to transcribe using SALT conventions. So all of the 1300 courses on our website under that training tab are the transcription ones. So these are self-paced. Um, 1300 is the first one and that's a just quick one hour roughly that just kind of is a quick and dirty gets you up and running um, for transcription and then the other courses go into a lot more detail about each one of the transcription um, conventions and then the last course is just a ton of sample practice um, opportunities with feedback. There's also um, on the SALT website and in the help menu of the software, there's a three page summary. And this is great. What I do is I just print this out and have it next to me as I'm transcribing just to kind of refresh my memory and refer. Um, even when you're an experienced transcriber, it's just really handy to have um, next to you. So that's um, a good resource. So the third step of the process is analyzing the language performance. So you're going to take that transcript um, and you're going to generate a bunch of analyses. So you can compare to age or grade match peers. Um, a good starting point that I'll demonstrate is to first go to the standard measures report, which is kind of the cover sheet. It covers lots of different language areas and then see what kind of is some um, highlighted on the standard measures report. And then based on that, go and generate supporting reports. And then we also have the performance report that we'll show you. And what that is, is it's basically a narrative um, that has some light interpretation and can kind of help you with report writing. And then the fourth step, which is always kind of fun too, is interpreting the results. So you're going to use all of that knowledge that we have um, about language development and compare to typical peers and take a further look and then try to figure out what the strengths and weaknesses are. Um, we'll point out again, uh, more online training. The 1400 courses are all about analysis. So that's... Um, there if you'd like more help in that area. Okay, so what we'll do now is we'll kind of go through the process that we talked about um, in the framework of a case study. So we're going to be listening to Cheyenne. She's in third grade. She's eight years, seven months, and she's going to be doing a narrative story retell. And she's already on caseload receiving services. So what we're going to do is listen to Shyana and then watch her transcript that matches her um, language. So you can kind of get a feel of what a transcript looks like and then kind of make your first impressions. What do you notice just by listening to Shyana? They wanted to name him. They wanted to name him all different kind of names, mm -hmm. but they um, named him Fluffy. Fluffy, fluff, fluffy hair was all uh, stiff, sticking up like fluff. He was, fluffy was sticking onto the door. Fluffy was so fluffy that um. Uh, he put holes in the bed. Fluffy was white. Fluffy uh, put holes in the umbrella. <coughs> Fluffy was playing on the tree. The tree fell. Fluffy was down on his head. Fluffy was taking a shower for 15 minutes. Okay, so Cheyenne, um, 
Definitely, you probably picked up on a few things that she has difficulty with with expressive language. So we'll get into her transcript and case study. What I want to do before we delve into that is just think about how do the SALT measures perform? Are there age-related changes? Or what about the speaking condition? So obviously, we know that there are age-related changes. So if we think about the span of language development, if we go from three-year-olds to 18-year-olds, um, there will be a lot of difference. Are there changes associated with the speaking condition? What can we expect as far as language measures based on a play or conversation compared to a persuasion? So we have a few graphs here, and there's just tons of colored squiggly lines, but um, the colored lines represent the speaking conditions. So down at the bottom, um, the red is the play, and then at the top, that's the persuasion. So this is what we expect um, for main length of utterance. This is based on the um, data from the SALT reference databases. So if you wanted to think, okay, if I have a 10-year-old, what is kind of a typical MLU based on a conversation or narrative student select or narrative story retell. So you can look at age 10 and then think, oh, okay, so their MLU is about seven if it's a conversation. And then if you look at the purple line um, for the narrative student selects, it bumps up to, oh, maybe eight and a half, nine. Um, and then the narrative story retell, the 10 year old, and kind of increases to almost 11. Um, for MLU in morphemes. So these can be kind of handy. Um, these are also located in the help menu if you want to reference those. So sometimes it's good to know just what is a typical um, language measure value based on age. So as expected for MLU, um, the higher the language demand, like a persuasive, persuasive sample or an expository, we have we notice a lot higher MLU. Okay, this next one is the number of different words um, based on 150 total words. So this is kind of interesting too. Really um, a lot of squiggly lines on this one. Um, the narrative story retell is that teal line in the middle. Um, that's kind of interesting. Those seven-year-olds really um, had a big, you know, skyrocket as far as number of different words. So um, just some interesting data to look at there. This is words per minute, so the speed of the sample, how fast do kids talk? So that we definitely see that linear increase, so definitely words per minute increases with age, and that looks fairly consistent across all um, speaking conditions, so that's kind of interesting. Um, it, if you think about a play-based sample, that makes sense. Words per minute is going to be lower if we're doing play-based tasks. Um, compared to like the expository, which is the orange line at the top here, um, that has a fairly consistent growth pattern with words per minute for those older kids. Um, maze and errors. So to me, this is kind of interesting. Um, what's typical for maze, <clears throat> maze behaviors? So mazes are the revisions, repetitions, false starts, filled pauses, and errors. And we all maze, we all have revisions, so what is normal? And do we make errors? I know myself, I make errors where I have to stop and kind of reformulate my sentence. So some of that is typical. Um, this is percent words in mazes. So again, um, the left hand, the y-axis is the percent mazes up to 16%, and then this is age. So this probably makes sense with what we know developmentally. The little kids, the three and four year olds, have a harder time getting their thoughts out. Um, if we look at the conversational sample of a um, four year old, it's almost 14% of words are in a maze. Um, it's interesting too if I look at the persuasion sample. So those are the older kids, the 13, um, 14 to 18 year olds. That's a harder task. It makes sense that maybe with that increased language demand, your verbal fluency might decrease because it's just a harder language task. So overall, um, we see, you know, in general, a little less mazing as kids get older. However, there may be a bump in the mazes depending on the more um, demand that it's placed on the speaker. 
This is percent utterances with heirs, up to 30%, and then up to 18 years old. So again, you can think if you have this chart to look like what is an average percent of heirs given the speaking context. Um, if we look at the eight, like an eight-year-old, um, it looks like a conversation, which is the green line, 9% heirs, and then it increases with more demanding tasks which also makes sense to me. Okay, so we will go back to Cheyenne now that we kind of have some um, understanding of the context's um, influence on language measures, the speaking context. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the SALT software, and we're going to look at the um, standard measures report, the analysis reports, and then the performance report, and we'll also um, demonstrate the quick look, which is new to SALT 20. Here we have Shina's actual transcript in the software. Just a couple of things before we go ahead with the analysis. Um, this was, a, as you recall, a narrative story retell. It was coded, um, some of the utterances have a D code there. That's for um, dialect. That might be something that you may want to go back and look at. Um, later. So that's what the decode is. It was also coded for the subordination index, which is basically a ratio of the number of clauses divided by the number of um, utterances. So those are all of the SI codes. So that'll tell us about um, her syntax skills. And then it also, if we scroll to the bottom, you can see it was scored for the narrative scoring scheme. So we kind of took the sample and applied lots of um, different analysis on top of it. Okay, so first thing that we're going to do is go into the database menu, and as soon as we do that, um, keep in mind the database menu is going to compare Cheyenne's sample to the database samples, so all that normative data. Everything we're pulling from here is based on our selection criteria. So you're asked to select the database samples that you want to use. So we're going to, it defaulted to the narrative story retell. The subgroup was a porcupine named Fluffy per our header over here. Um, and then generally I like to take the defaults. They're pretty straightforward. Age match plus or minus six months. You can play around with that if you need. Um, or you can go and match by grade or gender and then you do find match samples click there and there's 24 samples matched by age for Cheyenne so that's enough our rule of thumb is you want at least 20 samples and then step three is to um, select the method that you want to use to equate the samples so I'm gonna go ahead and take um, same number of total words Okay, and then there are 22 samples with 214 words, so that's a good amount of samples. I'll click OK. And then over on the right-hand side, you'll notice um, our target speaker, Cheyenne, and then down here in this box is the standard interval. So personally, I like to keep this at one, just so measures that could be of concern are highlighted. Um, so everything will be highlighted on the reports. That's one standard deviation away from the mean. Some clinicians like to set this to their district's criteria if they're really looking at kind of um, very stringent um, qualification guidelines. Sometimes that's helpful. And then measures that are 1.75 or whatever you set that to will be highlighted on the report. So just know that that is able to be changed if you want that. Okay, so then I selected OK, and now all of the reports are available to me on the database menu. So the first report that I like to run is the standard measures report. And then you are prompted to um, ask what you want your standard measures report based on. In this, I'm going to take the, there's also a recommended default, so entire transcript, um, since it is a narrative retell with a very kind of structured task. That's why that's the recommended. And then we can see the program calculating all of those language measures. And there's our report in a matter of seconds. Okay, so this is a good report to familiarize yourself with. Um, the top of the transcript, top one quarter there, gives you transcript information on the left and database information on the right in case you um, forget what you did as far as a comparison. And then if we go down, um, 
the body of the report. Everything on the left is the child's information here. And then to the middle of that gray column um, is the database measures. And then you'll notice that certain measures are highlighted in gray and have an asterisk. And that's those measures. Those are all of those measures that are one standard deviation away from the mean. So you can kind of go through and scan and probably at this point substantiate your initial impressions. We noticed that Cheyenne, um, a couple of the things that I noticed was, you know, kind of a low speaking rate. She seemed to really um, struggle with getting words out and sentences out, um, not very fluent, like that verbal facility type skill. Um, and I did also notice a few kind of articulation errors as well. So you can go through and kind of think, does this match my initial impressions? Um, let's go ahead and kind of go through some of the measures. So she had, her sample was seven minutes and 16 seconds long. Um, so that was longer than most samples. However, if you go to the measure above, um, she had fewer words. So she took longer and used fewer words. Intelligibility, slightly lower. Her narrative scoring scheme, so that's the macro analysis that looks at structure and content, was also a lower score at 16. She had a low MLU in both words and morphemes. Um, her mean verbs per utterance was low, and her SI composite score was also a little bit low, so subordination index, so how complex were her clauses, that was a little bit low. So those may be some areas that we'd want to look at as far as treatment. Um, semantics, a lot of those measures are also lower for Cheyenne. So total number of words was 214, and that put her at 1.48 standard deviations below the mean. And also her number of different words was two, over two standard deviations below the mean. So semantics is definitely an area um, that might be triggering, oh, maybe we should be addressing this in therapy. Um, and then the moving average type token ratio for um, her number of different words was also low. So a lot of um, a lot of challenges here. Verbal facility. So this looks at words per minute, pause time as a percent of total time, and then May's words as a percent of total words. So May's are the revisions, uh, repetitions, false starts, and filled pauses. And then also the percent of abandoned utterances is listed there. So you'll notice, um, so words per minute was 38.39. So that was 1.81 1 standard deviations below the mean. Um, her pause time uh, as percent of total time was 42%. So she had a higher pause time. So sometimes when you're interpreting the measures, you have to just be a little bit cautious so we don't want pause time to be a higher number than the database mean so that's still a rel relative challenge same with the number of maze words as a percentage of total words so almost 20 percent of her words were in a maze so although this is above the mean again that skill or that use of mazing isn't something that we want to be a high number and then percent of abandoned utterances was also um, a bit above the mean Okay, and then if we go down to the last section here, this is errors. So percent utterances with errors, omissions, and then error codes. All of these measures were below the database mean. So that's actually, you know, maybe a relative strength. She's having difficulty saying what she's getting out. Um, she's slower at doing it and doesn't have as, you know, sophisticated of a vocabulary, but she's not making tons of errors. So um, that kind of makes sense with that profile. Okay, so based on this standard measures report, I might want to dig up, dig up a couple other reports um, just to kind of explore. So what I would like to do is go into um, the database menu, and we recalled that like her semantics was a little bit low. So I might go into, um, I really like the grammatical categories report here. I'm going to go equated by length. Um, and this kind of tells you what parts of speech, so what grammatical category um, is a strength or maybe a relative weakness. Again, this can be really handy for coming up with um, treatment targets. So one thing, um, so it looks like, you know, she had enough adjectives and nouns, perhaps. That looks pretty good. Um, 
verbs was a little bit high. So it looks like nouns and verbs, maybe that's okay. They're kind of average. Um, and then if we go down here, adverbs, she had three and that was negative um, 2.35 below the mean. So that might be a little bit low. So maybe like those descriptor words. Um, and then our adjectives are okay. If we go down to the, the other one that I want to look at was the coordinators and subordinators. So, um, and yes, we can see those were a little bit lower. Um, so she had six coordinating conjunctions and two subordinating. So that kind of goes along with her lower subordination index score. So that might be something um, that we'd want to target in therapy as well. So that can give you kind of, if you're looking at specific skills, um, related to vocabulary that can be really great uh, a good report and also I like to use this one if I'm um, looking at progress monitoring if I've been working on pronouns or nouns whatever in therapy then I can do a time two and look at that again so just keep that in mind okay and then the next thing I want to go to is the verbal facility summary and that's in the database menu we'll equate it by length Okay, so again, this is looking at the rate and pause and then the amazing um, behaviors that she exhibits. And this can be handy, again, for breaking down um, the, the relative weakness that she's demonstrating. What does she really need help on? So um, we can look at, we knew that she had a slower words per minute. And then it also gives us our utterance per minute. So both of those were low. And then our pause time, that was on the standard measures report. So she's spending about 42% of the sample in a pause. So that's pretty significant. She had um, this, the next one is pauses within utterances. So in the middle of an utterance, she had 11 of those. Um, and then if we go down pauses between utterances, she had 21 of those. So there's 21 of those. Um, and the average pause time for those was 6.52 seconds. So that might really key in on, boy, she's really struggling to formulate an utterance. So that might be a good um, goal to work on in therapy. And then if we go down to the about bottom one third here, I'll scroll up a little bit. Um, this is the maze summary. And we knew that, um, so if we go utterances with mazes as a percent of total utterances, so 47% of her utterances had a maze. So that might be a good um, baseline data for a goal too. We could think about it in terms of that. So almost half of her utterances have a maze. Now this doesn't tell us necessarily the extent or the extremeness of the maze. It could just be a fill pause um, but that's still an utterance that would be marked as containing a maze. If we go down to the bottom, um, total maze components. So this kind of breaks down how many revisions, repetitions, filled pauses, and then within that, how many revisions were part word, full word, or phrase level. So it looks like mostly what Cheyenne is doing is part word and word repetitions. Too. So that might be kind of her strategy for buying a little time, thinking about what she wants to say. So um, anyway, that can be just really helpful as far as thinking in terms of um, writing goals for your report. Okay, um, and then what we might do too is I can remember it was her sample was scored for the narrative scoring scheme. If I go into the database menu. I can select this report, and then this brings up all of the um, items that were scored for that, all the categories. So we can look at specifically, is she having more um, difficulty in one area of that structure and content assessment than another? So this is based on the scoring rubric. It's available in the help menu of the software, um, and there's criteria for how to score each one of the story retells. So sometimes we might see something, um, so it looks like her mental state words were really low. Um, so that's a one, this is scored on a um, one to five basis. So a one is a significantly lower score. Um, character development, introduction, and cohesion. So that makes sense, the cohesion kind of the flow, use of transition words and et cetera, um, it was a little bit lower. 
mental states. Again, that's kind of a higher level inferential thinking um, and vocabulary, so that's not too surprising considering that her semantics were a little bit lower. So that is also there. Um, and then we'll go and look at the um, subordination index. So that's under the syntax and morphology. Okay, and this her composite score is a little bit lower. She mostly looks like uses um, score sentences that have a score of SI1, so one clause sentence. So 32 of her utterances had one clause. So that was a little bit higher than the database mean. And then she had five utterances with two. So a little bit lower as far as her um, sentence complexity. Okay, so, and again, keep in mind, everything from this database has that normative data. You'll notice in the analyze menu, um, and also in the database menu, the reports are reorganized in SALT 20 based on language domain. So hopefully this will make it easier for clinicians to kind of hone in on the reports that are going to be most important for what you're concerned about or looking at um, as far as kind of analyzing your sample. So as you can see um, in the analyze menu, there's just a lot of different reports. Um, we can go down and maybe open one of these up. These reports, again, will not have any normative data, so it's just straight up statistics in these. So we could go, for example, we'll look at the verbal facility summary. Okay, so this is pretty much that same report that we pulled from the database menu, um, but as you can see, there's not any um, normative data on the right-hand side. So just to, so you can kind of compare and contrast the difference between the two. Um, in general, reports from the Analyze menu can either be supplemental, um, if you're wanting to look at maybe like bound morphine tables, something that might not be available in the database menu, that's great. It's also really handy to use if you are doing a sample that doesn't follow one of the SALT protocols. So just keep that in mind. Um, there's just so many reports and they're organized um, by language domain. Okay, so that's kind of the basis of running your analysis. So I wanted to go and um, show you a couple of things that can really help you with your report writing and also kind of presenting your data from your language sample analysis. So the first section um, in the database menu is overview. So we ran the standard measures report. The next one listed is the performance report. And it asks you for how, for how you want to refer to the speaker. So I usually keep the name and then there's options for gender there. And then you can click OK. And then what this is, is a, basically a written out kind of report with very light interpretation. So this can be particularly helpful for new learners of SALT if you're a little unsure um, as far as what the measures mean. It'll say this is lower than the database mean, um, which may indicate word retrieval or utterance formulation issues, but it's not going to be um, necessarily diagnosing for you. But again, light interpretation. So this is great um, because you can go in and you can edit this as you see fit. So, um, you know, you could put Cheyenne created or completed a narrative story retell. Um, I, sometimes I might put she listened attentive, attentively and presented her best skills or something like that. So you can go ahead and just, um, you know, type whatever you want. She gave her best effort. Anyway, you can see... Um, that it's very easy to just go in and edit this. And then what I do is I just simply highlight and copy this and then paste it into my electronic um, record system. You can also save this as a text file or you can save it as a PDF if you are done with it that way. So this um, can really save you a lot of time when it comes to reporting your findings. And the other quick um, reporting is the quick look. And this is basically just a chart, and this can be really handy. I found this helpful if you're in a large meeting and you don't have 20 minutes to go over your diagnostic results. This is an easy to read chart, and it goes by the skill, and then it's just simply a, you know checking a box. Is it a strength? Is it within normal limits? Or is it a relative weakness? So this is, again, just easy to read. 
Um, some of the categories on the left, like macro analysis, obviously if you did a conversation that wouldn't be there. Um, so it depends on the, it's tailored to the elicitation that you used. Um, however, this can be great just to have kind of a quick visual that's representative of the language sample without overwhelming IEP members, um, team members, or parents um, with lots of stats and data. So, and this can be helpful to, and you know, show them this and then say, this is what we're going to work on in therapy based on the relative weaknesses. Okay, so let's just take a couple minutes towards the end here to um, just talk about how you can use SALT to get your baseline data for your IEPs um, and then the reporting. So we can really use a lot of those measures for baseline data and then a language sample is always able to be repeated. So it's a really good way to think about progress monitoring as well. So as you recall, Cheyenne really had difficulty with pauses. She had lots of mazes consisting of mostly repetitions and revisions. So I might write a goal something like increase utterances without revisions or repetitions from 50% of utterances to 70% of utterances um, as measured by a language sample. I could also, you know, write this as a word level goal. I think it was 19% of her words. So, you know, from 80% of words to 90% of words, not being in a maze. Um, so lots of flexibility there. And then also if we remember her low MLU and her subordination index, kind of that um, semantic piece, and then just that very simple sentence structure. So based on the grammatical categories, we noticed that she had lower number of mental state words. So that might be something that we could address, like that inferential thinking, um, and that's very literacy based, like how are the characters feeling? Um, so that might be a good target as far as increasing vocabulary, and it also would increase, you know, the vocabulary that she would have available to make a more complex sentence, obviously. Um, and then the other goal that we might do is to increase the use of conjunctions. Compared to her um, database peers, she was using fewer subordinating and coordinating conjunctions. So that might be a um, good target for therapy. And then we can go and pull up that grammatical categories report after we've done some um, treatment sessions targeting those. So just to get you thinking about how to get the most out of your sample, you can get some good baseline data. Okay, and then just um, again to just summarize to make sure to remember to use that performance report, edit it for your reports. It makes report writing just a snap and really fast and easy. Um, it's well worth your time that you spent transcribing your sample. You save it at the back end with the report pretty much being written for you. And then also the quick look um, table is great for sharing at meetings. Okay, that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you so much for watching. And our resources, our website, phone number, and email is listed here. We would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching.